Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to start with the new chapter on torsion. Now, torsion is a chapter which almost all of you must have covered in your undergraduate mechanics of solids or mechanics of materials class. So, as part of this advanced mechanics of solids, the new thing that we are going to address is torsion of non-circular cross sections. So that's making it much more general than what you have already studied under torsion. So. Uh, uh, with that uh, concern, uh, we look at this particular diagram where we have uh, this shaft or beam uh, and you can clearly see that the cross section over here is very much non-circular. Okay. Uh, now, uh, we will also see how uh, this more general formulation will, uh, we can specialize it to the, uh, to uh, to the simple things which you had studied uh, in the context of torsion of a circular cross section. Now, uh, what we have over here is that this shaft or beam it is being subjected to this torque at this end and an equal and opposite torque at the other end. Now, it is extremely important to note, uh, uh, although I'm sure you, you, you already know this from your undergraduate studies, that when you're looking at this from this end, this torque is looking like anti-clockwise. Now, if you're looking at this very shaft from the other end, it will again, this particular thing, which is now clockwise from this side, that will look anti-clockwise. Okay, so that thing must be very, very clear and it's important. Now, uh, as we have done in the previous theories, we started out with a kinematical hypothesis and that's exactly the same thing that we are going to do. Now, uh, all that we are going to write uh, or everything that we are going to write will be referred uh, to a particular cross section. Okay, So let me consider this cross section here. So I have slightly made it bigger uh, in order to make it clearer. And uh, let me uh, write out uh, the x axis and the y axis here. So it is something like this. But very important note is that the x-axis, the, the origin of, the, of our xyz uh, axis, they are at the other end. And it is this end that I am talking over here. In fact, it, it could be any particular or any, any, any cross section within the, within the length of the beam. Okay. Uh, let me adjust it a bit. Okay. So that's my x axis, that's my y axis. Now, uh, under the action of this torque, any point within this cross section, uh, it will uh, undergo certain displacement. And as part of our kinematical hypothesis, we would like to uh, represent that displacement. Okay. So, uh, suppose we have a point here in the undeformed configuration that is before the torque has been applied. Now as a, uh, as a result of the application of the torque, you can understand that this point may travel to this point. Okay. Now uh, what we are going to do as part of our formulation is that we are going to consider such displacements to be very small. Okay. So everything that we are going to write will be within the purview of small displacements. Okay, so uh, so small strains, infinitesimal strains. That's what we are we are going to be concerned with. Okay, so even this kind of a displacement that I have shown for the purpose of clarity is quite exaggerated actually. Now, uh, what I'll say is um, this this thing. This is my R. And this is my theta, and uh, this r theta it represents the uh, coordinate of this yellow colored point in the undeformed configuration. So in the deformed configuration, uh, we can we can understand that uh, 
there will be a bit of an angular displacement and that will be given by uh, so this small angle over here that is uh, that I'll call as beta now question is what is this displacement in terms of u v and w okay so let us discuss that in detail now in order to uh, to to understand the geometry here what we can do is uh, we can draw this line and we can zoom into it okay let us zoom into it a little bit so this is uh, this is the this is the same line that I have drawn over here and uh, because I have considered this angle beta to be small so this length it is approximately this is approximately equal to r beta it is not perfectly equal to r beta but approximately r beta especially this is especially true if beta is small so can we represent this uh, the, the the component of this in the x direction what i mean to say is what is this what is this horizontal displacement what is this vertical displacement okay so this u uh, can we not write it as r beta okay so what is this angle so you have to understand that this is theta uh, this is 90 degree minus theta um, sorry this is 90 degrees so this is 90 degrees minus theta so this is theta okay so this is theta so this this particular part that will be given by sine theta but of course with a negative sign similarly the displacement along the y direction that will be given by this vertical dash line and that will be given by our beta cos theta now you please note that what is this r sine theta that r sine theta is it not simply y so this is nothing but minus y beta similarly this r cos theta over here that is simply x so this becomes x beta what about w so this is the part uh, so when we start thinking about w it is the out of plane displacement okay that we have to understand physically or geometrically now when we were talking about uh, torsion with respect uh, for a for a shaft with circular cross section in our undergraduate days then uh, we knew that the out of plane displacement of that circular shaft uh, was zero and that is the primary difference that we have with uh, for a non circular cross section that this out of plane displacement is not going to be zero all right so this non zero thing that will be represented uh, that will represent by this greek letter kappa and this kappa is going to be a function of only x and y okay now you can start thinking about it in terms of uh, plane strain conditions but please be very careful when you before you leap uh, uh, leap to any any conclusion regarding the analogy with uh, regarding the plane strain condition okay so please be very very careful furthermore 
uh, one very important thing which will uh, say is that uh, the rate of twist the rate of twist is uh, referred to this end what is the uh, twist that is induced by this torsion at a certain distance from from it okay so refer to this end how much any particular cross section that we may consider along the length that has twisted twisted means turned around okay so this is this is a, this kind of displacement is a result of the twist so how much is the twist so we represent uh, that rate of twist or the twist uh, per unit length uh, as alpha okay so so we say rate but it is it has nothing to do with time okay it is the rate of twist per unit length so that is that is given by this alpha and that is this d uh, d beta dz okay so you can understand that uh, when uh, we are at z equal to 0 that is at this end then uh, this beta that is equal to 0 and when we are at this end we have the maximum value of that but this alpha itself that is not changing that is a uh, uh, that is a constant along this length so uh, what we have just said regarding this alpha is somewhat reminiscent of what you had studied uh, in the context of circular cross section also okay so let me write this down so uh, at z equal to 0 we have beta equal to 0 and at z equal to uh, so or, or or we can say that at any at any generic general z uh, at any general z our beta is equal to alpha z okay now if this is so if this beta is like alpha z then we can come to this expression and write this as minus uh, alpha y z similarly this can be written as alpha x z later on what we are going to do is to also represent this deformation represented by the kappa in terms uh, of this alpha also but but uh, but that is for later okay uh, so right now what we want to do is as part of our kinematical hypothesis so, so see all these things that you have discussed this is part of our kinematical hypothesis so what we want to do next is to write down the various values of the springs okay so epsilon xx that is equal to del u del x you can just take a look here the u is completely independent of x okay this alpha is a constant y and z are certainly independent of x so del u del x is equal to 0 epsilon y y that is equal to del v del y let's check v here alpha is a constant x and z are independent of y so del v del y is equal to 0 next epsilon zz that is del w del z but we have already taken as part of our kinematical hypothesis that w is equal to kappa and kappa is a pure function of x and y that is it is independent of z so w is independent of z so del w del z is equal to 0 next for epsilon xy we have half del u del y plus del v del x let's see what happens to it 
So del u del y is minus alpha z. This is minus alpha z. Next, v, so we need the del v del x. So for that we have alpha z plus alpha z. So this also is 0. Next, epsilon y z. We have del v del z plus del w del y. Well, v is alpha x z, so del v del z is nothing but alpha x. Plus, you see this w is a function of, uh, uh, through, through, through its representation in terms of kappa, it is a function of x and y, but you don't know its exact form. Okay, so we have to keep it as it is. The only thing that we can do it uh, do here is to write it in terms of the kappa and just leave it like this. Next, for epsilon zx, we have half del w del x plus del u del z. So let me first write this del u del z. Del u del z is minus alpha y. minus alpha y plus del w del x that gives me del kappa del x. So the only uh, non-zero components of the strings of the infinitesimal strings are this epsilon y z and epsilon z x. Okay. So uh, next what I'm going to do is exactly so the overall uh, overall uh, formulation here is following exactly what we had done in our previous chapters except that as a result of the special considerations associated with distortion and the, and the kinematical hypothesis associated therewith uh, we are getting different uh, uh, so the so the non-zero components of the strains have turned out to be uh, in for the epsilon yz and the epsilon zx unlike before uh, but but uh, but the strategy remains same so what we are going to do next is to use the virtual work equation uh, so that we can ultimately arrive at the governing equations and boundary conditions. Okay. So uh, let me go to the new page and use the virtual work equation. So first of all, I have this term, sigma ij, del epsilon ij, dv, and that is equal to ti del ui. Da. And again, you note that I am disregarding the body forces here. So first of all, I'll consider the left hand side. So I have this sigma ij del epsilon ij dv. Now please note that there will be no contribution associated with the terms involving the sigma xx, the sigma yy and the sigma zz because we have already found in the previous page that epsilon xx, epsilon yy and epsilon zz are zero. Okay. Furthermore, uh, the epsilon xy is also 0, so there will be no contribution from the term involving the sigma xy. But we will have contributions from, uh, from the terms with the subscripts yz and zx, and because there will be two such terms for those uh, from the yz and the zy, as well as from the zx and xz, what we are going to end up with is, uh, is basically this that we'll have twice sigma or sigma yz twice sigma yz del epsilon yz plus twice sigma zx del epsilon zx. This is over the entire volume and uh, what we can do is 
we can uh, we can rewrite this entire you know, volume term as uh, as the area multiplied by the length okay so first we are going to integrate over a particular cross section and then integrate over the entire length and because there is no variation along the length so uh, what will basically happen is that the uh, will have uh, will have the length uh, the l coming out of the integration okay so uh, we'll also take this twice out furthermore you note that this sigma yz that can be written as twice g epsilon yz okay uh, that is from the constitutive relation so overall what we are going to have is 4 epsilon yz del epsilon yz plus uh, we'll also have twice g epsilon zx here so that 4 also has gone out uh, this is epsilon zx del epsilon zx <coughs> so this is integration with respect to uh, the entire area and uh, what we have uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, we should not forget this g that has come out uh, and the length has also come out of this okay so basically what you have done is to do an integration with respect to the area and then another integration with respect to dz but everything else here is independent of z so uh, so that integration with uh, with respect to dz that is just alone and that just contributes an l okay uh, so we have done these kinds of things uh, many times earlier i'm not going to the details of that all right now we have this 4gl now it's time to substitute these um, the expressions of this epsilon yz and epsilon zx from what we had obtained in the previous page so let's take a look here uh, epsilon yz is this thing uh, half of alpha x plus del kappa del y So half of alpha x plus del kappa del y multiplied by so now we have this x delta alpha plus del delta kappa del y plus for the epsilon zx we have minus alpha y plus del kappa del x minus alpha y plus del kappa del x multiplied by this del of epsilon zx that is um, minus y del alpha plus del delta kappa del x and of course I'll have a half over here this is within the integration with respect to the entire cross-sectional area so you can see uh, and there will be a half over here also there will be a half over here also so I'll, I'll correct that so this 4 will cancel with this half times half and what I'll do over here is to multiply this term uh, so I'll, I'll expand this out a little bit okay so just make a little space for myself here so I have alpha x plus del kappa del y that multiplied by this x 
then I'll have a delta alpha and over here also I'll have a similar kind of term involving the delta alpha so uh, I have this minus alpha y plus del kappa del x multiplied by this minus y and this entire thing so maybe I should clear write that a bit more clearly Uh, I think I'll, I'll just write this with an integration like this with a delta alpha here okay let me not make this an entire integration within a square bracket okay and uh, here I have I missed writing that GL so I'll just put that in I'll also have another term GL so this time I'm going to multiply this with this so I have alpha x plus del kappa del y del delta kappa del y and uh, let me just adjust that a little bit plus this term minus alpha plus del kappa del x multiplied by this del delta kappa del x and so there we have it here okay now uh, what we are going to do um, is to try to manipulate this thing a little bit uh, taking lessons from what we had already done in the previous two chapters on classical plate theory and the popple von Kármán plate theory the motivation here is to arrive at uh, at an equation which will only involve or at least terms which will involve uh, this delta kappa alone without any uh, any any of these derivatives okay so let's see if we can do that so what I'll do is I'll copy this entire line I'll copy this entire line and go to the next page okay So this first term that can be slightly simplified uh, so we have this alpha x square and then alpha y square and then we have this alpha x del kappa del y minus Um, so this alpha shouldn't be here minus y del kappa del x Okay. Next, from here, what I'll do is uh, I will take this del del y uh, out of uh, out of this thing, so so that the alpha x plus del kappa del y becomes within this del del y. Uh, 
is something like this together with this delta kappa and then i'll have to compensate for this uh, for this uh, extra term that i have introduced here by subtracting this term next for this term i'll do the exact same thing and then compensate uh, I believe I have missed one term over here uh, so this particular thing uh, it was uh, its origin was here so we, I had a minus alpha y over here instead of just the alpha so i'll make a correction this was minus alpha y consequently i'll have a minus alpha y over here and uh, here also i'll have a minus alpha y sorry about that And here also all right so overall let's see what we are uh, obtaining here um this thing whatever we could do we have done uh over here uh you see this entire combination this del del x of something plus del del y of something uh, that can be rewritten uh, using the green's theorem as we had done in the case of uh so I, i'll not repeat this line over here instead i'll just copy it from the previous thing so there it is exactly the same as the previous line uh, here as i was saying this del del x of something plus del del y of something for that i will utilize the green's theorem uh, to uh, to write that as uh, in terms of the nx and the ny uh, but uh, i think it will be just uh, easier if i if i just postpone uh, writing that uh, for now i'll just club them together uh, to be manipulated later okay so it's something like this that i have this uh, so let me just copy this thing i'll have this term and i'll have this term and there is there should be a plus in between so this entire thing is where i am going to use uh, our green's theorem later on and the terms that we are left with uh, they are here okay so 
I take this minus and this minus out. Uh, so I'll be left with uh, Uh, let me just write that down so del del x minus alpha y plus del kappa del x plus del del y alpha x plus del kappa del y so again i have written this term first here and this term here second okay and there is a delta kappa sitting outside and this entire integration is with respect to a so overall as i had already mentioned uh, structurally what we are doing uh, in terms of our uh, mathematical derivation is exactly the same as before the terms just look different because we are dealing with the torsion that's all there is to it okay but let us not forget that what you have managed to achieve here is some manipulation associated with just the left hand side of the virtual work equation the right hand side is still left okay so what is the right hand side I'll, well let me go to the next page here uh, the right hand side is this ti delta ui da now you see this is the uh, this is the externally applied fraction but what do we have really in terms of the external loading it is the torsion the actual torque so uh, how can we uh, uh, represent this ti delta ui uh, in terms of the torque and uh, and the twist that it is uh, that the shaft is undergoing so uh, consider this let me give you the answer and then ask you to think about it is it not something like this that we have the torque and the associated uh, deflection that it induces which is just an angle so uh, and you see the the unit here is actually uh, I mean it, it'll match with whatever we have written over here okay now uh, it perhaps makes sense uh, to uh, well, uh, let me not get ahead of myself. So it's something like this that uh, we would very much like to uh, to understand to to uh, to understand this thing uh, in terms of this thing. So can we not perhaps think of this torque like some kind of a uh, has been contributed by some kind of a force okay so this is uh, I'm, I'm trying to draw an analogy here that if you have some kind of a cross section like this and you have a torque being applied like this then can you not think of this torque uh, as some force okay so, so perhaps you you considered a point here and you considered a little force here then can you not think of this torque as being generated by a series of such forces uh, where the moment arm would be given by this distance okay so suppose we calculate this torque about the uh, about the origin then uh, we have this r times this f where this f is uh, well can think of it in terms of t by r okay now it is extremely important to note that this r here is not a constant this r will vary as this orange colored line it varies over the entire periphery which means uh, meaning to say that this r here is a function of theta okay which makes sense of course so overall that entire thing is what is going to give us uh, this kind of a term but it's also important to note that uh, Uh, this thing that we uh, that we have over here um, can we perhaps write this can we perhaps write this 
okay so let me take you to the first page you see this beta is uh, in terms of this alpha z so uh, can we uh, perhaps think of this as t times l delta alpha so what am i doing over here you see um, what what has actually gone on over here you can try to think of it like this that the rhs uh, so th this this is one way of thinking uh, that we have something like d uh, t delta beta evaluated at z equal to l minus t times delta beta evaluated at z equal to 0 then this thing is like t delta beta but this is like this boundary terms so that we can rewrite this thing in terms of an integration like this t d delta beta dz dz integration 0 to l so that this uh, this thing inside the integration that can be rewritten as t delta of d beta dz dz and this is like so d beta dz is nothing but alpha and now you see this alpha is very much independent of z so that overall what we'll have is t delta alpha integration 0 to l that gives me this thing okay so that's how i like to think of uh, going from here to here uh, so if you can try to uh, i mean maybe you can try to come up with, the, uh, with a different sort of interpretation okay now uh, the fact remains that we do have this tl delta alpha on the right hand side now uh, so let me just complete this what i was discussing here so this is like a t by r and this r here is is a function of theta okay just to complete that picture okay now what we want to do is of course uh, take this lhs equal to rhs and see what kind of terms uh, we'll get okay so what i'll do is i'll take this entire thing maybe make it a little bit smaller so that it becomes a little bit more visually manageable And on the right hand side, I have this TL delta alpha. All right. So you see, uh, on the right hand side, we have a term involving the delta alpha. Okay. So what we plan to do now, see, this is basically the virtual work equation. Okay. And from this virtual work equation, we want to extract the boundary conditions and the uh, and the you know, governing equations and whatever so uh, on the right hand side we have this delta alpha on the left hand side we have this delta alpha now you may be a little bit disheartened by the fact that this del delta alpha is sitting within this integration and on the right hand side it is just sitting without the integration okay but uh, there is no reason to feel disheartened because uh, you see this delta alpha uh, i mean it might as well be going outside this integration because uh, over this integration i mean this is this is an integration over the xy domain 
and this alpha is very much independent of x and y okay so it can it can very well come out of this integration so it's like g alpha delta uh, g l delta alpha this and that term so uh, if you want to equate so all that you have to do is uh, you can extract this thing and utilize it with this here okay so that's exactly what we are going to do but let us not forget that we have still not simplified this term okay so we would very much like to utilize our uh, uh, our Green's theorem to, to simplify this uh, and represent this in terms of an integration over the periphery so let's do, do that So I'll again copy this. Plus GL this thing minus alpha y plus del kappa del x delta kappa and x plus this thing within the curly bracket alpha x plus del kappa del y delta kappa and y and uh, this entire thing will be uh, will be just this cyclic integral okay so this integration which was over the entire domain here has now become an integration over the entire periphery not over the entire domain a okay so this is the s variable representing the uh, variable tracking the periphery of the uh, of the cross section this term however will remain as it is and so also the right right hand side term okay so now we are ready to uh, extract the different parts out of it so the first thing is we are going to uh, so let me write a therefore here okay so gl integration over the entire domain this thing alpha x square plus y square Sorry about that. Alpha times x square plus y square plus x del kappa del y minus y del kappa del x dA that is going to be equal to dL. So, so you see what I have done here is to basically first take this delta alpha outside and then equate that term with the term on the right hand side which also has this uh, coefficient of, uh, of this delta alpha okay next we are going to consider the term on the left hand side which has this delta kappa and you please note that on the right hand side I don't have any term involving delta kappa okay there is no integration term involving the delta kappa. in fact there is no other term involving the delta kappa so all that I have to do is to consider uh, just this uh, uh, just whatever is present inside here uh, and I can write that down so del del x minus alpha plus del kappa del x plus del del y of alpha x plus del kappa del y and you see this is a nice equation 
because you see here the alpha is very much independent of x and y is independent of x which means that del del x of minus alpha y is just zero similarly here alpha is independent of y and x is certainly independent of y so del del y of alpha x that term is going to be zero so overall what i'll end up with uh, here is del square kappa del x square plus del square kappa del y square that is equal to zero okay and finally what i will be left with is just this term okay just this term and again you note that uh, uh, okay so this is the this is the uh, boundary term okay okay so uh, there's a little trick involved here uh, you may be tempted to write or extract out of this term uh, something like an either or statement okay so perhaps you would uh, you you take this delta kappa common here so it will be left with this uh, all these terms involving the nx and ny and then perhaps you would be writing either that term involving the nx and y is equal to zero or kappa is specified because you would have this delta kappa but you please note that uh, i mean saying a thing or or considering the possibility of kappa being specified really doesn't make any sense because kappa is the out of plane displacement of the shaft okay and that is uh, never going to be specified to us okay so let me just take a look at the figure that we have drawn initially you see the kappa represents uh, it's just the w okay so that is something very much not known to us okay and for a situation like this you will never expect that 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 kappa the w the out of plane displacement will be specified to us okay so for all intents and purposes what we can do oh, considering this term is to simply say that this term involving the nx and ny that is directly uh, uh, that is going to be uh, the one uh, with the zero okay so uh, so let's see um yeah i can write it here minus alpha y plus del kappa del x multiplied by nx plus alpha x plus del kappa del y multiplied by ny that thing is going to be zero on the boundary on the boundary of the cross section okay so there is a subtle logic involved here so uh, what are the things that we are obtaining we are obtaining one governing differential equation involving this kappa we are obtaining one uh, one equation which is valid over the boundary so that is like our boundary uh, boundary condition and please note that that does involve this kappa and we are also obtaining this extra equation which uh, sort of connects our applied load t to uh, to this kappa okay so we don't have the kappa here but in this term we certainly have the presence of this kappa and it is a big sigh of relief for us that we do have such an equation otherwise you see what would have happened is that in this equation which we are referring to as the governing equation we do not have the presence of this t and th and in this equation which we are referring to as the boundary condition there also the t is not present so how can it be that we are uh, we are uh, obtaining a framework for solving for the out of plane displacement represented by this kappa but in this entire business the influence of the applied load which is actually bringing about the twist or the torsion that is not present that would have been absolutely uh, meaningless so if if we had obtained an equation which was just these two equations and not and we did not have the presence of this equation then it would have been really really uh, troublesome for us
okay because then we have completely lost the connection between the source of all our deflection which is the torsion and the deflection itself okay so oh, no. so considering these three equations together we are at least uh, happy that uh, okay uh, we have a source of the deflection uh, and we have a uh, connection between the deflection and the and the source and we also have a separate equation and boundary condition for solving that deflection okay so overall if we if we solve these things these three things together we should be able to uh, obtain it obtain the solution so uh, we will go towards a towards a solution for that uh, in the next video thank you very much